Welcome back to the Game Corner. With Super Mario Bros. Lost Levels being deemed too difficult for the United States and European video game markets, Nintendo had to come up with an idea fast for a new sequel to Super Mario Bros. within the foreseeable future. Now we obviously know that eventually happened, but how exactly did that occur? So after the Lost Levels was rejected by Nintendo of America, Nintendo of Japan had to find some way to provide a suitable sequel for everyone else in the world. Now an employee of Nintendo of Japan named Kensuke Tanabe had been working on a prototype vertical platformer for the Famicom, but it didn't get very far and the idea was eventually shelved. However, in 1987, Fuji TV, which was a Japanese television broadcaster, approached Nintendo to make a game for their upcoming summer festival. This would eventually lead to the creation of the game Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic. I won't go into full detail as to what was changed between the games, but the point is that this was the game that Nintendo chose to Mario 5 for North America and Europe, and renaming it to Super Mario Bros. 2. Now many Mario fans don't classify this game as a Mario game due to its origins, but I disagree. In recent years it has been confirmed that the prototype platform I mentioned earlier was initially intended to be used for a Mario game, so it is likely that regardless of Fuji TV asking Nintendo to make a game or not is kind of irrelevant, mainly because North America and Europe would have ended up with the Mario game similar to the one we got. But anyways, let's talk about the story. In the last review I mentioned that most Mario games revolved around the same plot of rescuing the princess from Bowser. But this is one of the exceptions. When you turn on the game and wait for a few seconds, the title screen will give you the basic gist of the plot. So one night, Mario had a dream. He dreamed of a stairway leading up to a door where he opened it and saw a world he had never seen before. He then heard voices calling out saying, Welcome to Subcon. The people of Subcon told Mario of a vicious tyrant called Wart who had cursed the world. They told Mario to stop Wart at all costs, to which Mario then woke up. The next day, Mario traveled with Luigi, Toad, and the princess to a mountain to have a picnic. There they spotted a cave and decided to investigate. To everyone's surprise, the cave contained a stairway to a door, just like in Mario's dream. While this story doesn't have much going on, it is nice to have a Mario game that doesn't follow the standards, which helps to stand out a little more. Speaking of standing out, the graphics sure look different. After three years since Super Mario Bros., Super Mario Bros. 2 greatly improved upon the design of the characters in the world. In this game, the colors just pop out more and the game feels much more alive. Also in this game, it established Mario and Luigi's current design by wearing the same colored hat and shirt, but different covered overalls. This is sort of strange since the cover art retains Mario's original design. With everything being much more colorful and alive, it makes the gaming experience much more enjoyable. When examining the gameplay, there is very little in common between the previous Mario games and this one. For starters, at the beginning of every course, four characters are choosable. Mario, Luigi, Toad, and the Princess. Each character has different abilities. Mario is all around average, no noticeable strengths or weaknesses. Luigi has the highest jump and the longest jumping distance, but his feet are somewhat slippery, but not to the extent of Lost Levels Luigi. Toad is the fastest character, but has a poor jump, and the Princess is pretty slow in everything, but she can glide in the air for a short time, making some levels a complete joke. It's this custom ability that makes Super Mario Bros. 2 more replayable and, in my opinion, more enjoyable than Lost Levels, or even the original in some aspects. By having different characters available to you, you can decide at the beginning of a level who you want to tackle what stage. There are fewer worlds and stages than in the previous games, but each level is much bigger than the average level in the first game and Lost Levels. There are a total of seven worlds, with three levels each, except for World 7, which only has two. You may notice from the footage that the high score and time limit have been removed. This allows you to spend as much time as you need exploring for certain things. The levels also allow you to go back in the stage in case you may have missed something. This design choice was a very good one, as in the last two games, you couldn't go back at all unless you died. While Mario and the game can still run and jump all willy-nilly, there are some differences in terms of attack. There are no traditional power-ups in this game. Instead, Mario and his friends pluck up vegetables from the ground or enemies and chuck them at other enemies. Well, this is very untraditional of a 2D Mario game to play like this. I don't think that the decision to remove power-ups was a bad thing. Instead, this game makes the player rely more on the environment of a level to finish it, rather than a power-up, which is nothing more than an extension of Mario's abilities. Not to say the power-ups are bad, but they wouldn't have worked well in the design of this game. However, there are power-up-like items. If you happen to pluck up a potion and throw it on the ground, it then creates a door to another dimension where you can pluck up coins or find a mushroom to extend your health bar, or make you bigger if you have one health point left. The mushroom also extends the life bar for the rest of the stage. If you happen to die in that stage, your health bar retains its current length. Instead of collecting regular coins, the game has cherries to collect. 
If you obtain around four or five cherries, then the Starman will appear and make you invincible for a short time. There are also stopwatches which can stop time for a few seconds. Now the coins are used to get one-ups like in the previous games, but it requires the player to play a gambling-like mini-game at the end of a stage. One-ups are present in some stages, but for the most part, the only way to increase your lives is by playing this mini-game. Personally, I think it would have been better if you could choose to play the mini-game after a stage, but it doesn't really ruin the experience for me. If you happen to lose all of your lives, you will get a game over, but you can continue. Unfortunately, there are only two continues. If you lose both of them, then it's back to the tile screen. In terms of enemies, there are a ton of brand new faces. First are Shy Guys, which just walk around and are essentially just like the Goombas of the first game. Next are Tweeters, who also walk around, but they sort of hop, more or less. Sniffits, which are Shy Guys that have gas mask-like face wear that shoot out little balls that can hurt you. Ninjis that jump up and down. Bezos that fly towards you and quickly to hurt you. Hoopsters that climb up and down vines. Fanto, which chases you after grabbing a key. Trouters that are just fish that jump high in the air. Porcupose, which are just Sonic's ancestors. Bob bombs, which walk around until they explode. Albatross, who are just birds that sometimes drop a bombs. Pidgeots that are just birds on a magic carpet. Cobras that come out of pipes or sand. Panzers, which fire fireballs either straight up or in an arc. Pokies that are just cactus. Flurries that run around on ice and can slip off. And sparks that are electric spheres that can harm you. There are a few variations of the Shy Guys, like on ostriches or moving fire cannons. But overall, there's a much bigger and more diverse cast of enemies compared to the last two games. Now a new aspect of this game is boss battles. There are a total of seven, each taking place at the end of a world. But at the end of almost every stage, there is an encounter with Birdo, a dinosaur-like specimen that likes to shoot its eggs, or in some cases, fireballs, at you. The goal in these fights is to use the egg shot at you, or a mushroom block, to hit Birdo three times so you can get the orb to open the mouth of the bird to the end of the stage. Now as far as bosses, there are two encounters with Mauser, a mouse that likes to throw bombs at you. Two encounters with Triclide, who spits fire at you. One fight with Fry Guy, who moves around the stage trying to spit fire at you and splits into four after three hits. And Claw Grip, or I'm sorry, Claw Glip, who throws rocks at you and you must throw back at him. The final boss is Ward himself, who has the Dream Machine, which is the source of his power. In order to defeat him, you must throw vegetables at him to make him croak. But where do you get them from? The Dream Machine. Are you serious? The source of Ward's power, the Dream Machine, is helping me defeat him. Man, Ward must have gotten really ripped off at his local Dream Machine store. Anyways, after 7 or 8 throws of veggies, Wart is down and the character you chose releases the people of Subcon. Afterwards, the people of Subcon take Wart's body to who knows where, and you are given a tally of how many times you used a particular character. I obviously chose Luigi the most, and then it's revealed it was all a dream. While that may be a letdown to some, it doesn't really bother me that much. But that ending theme is pretty good. And speaking of ending themes, music. There are about as many tracks as there were in the first game, including the overworld theme. The underground theme. The other world theme, which is just the Mario theme. The battle theme. And Wart's theme. While there isn't much more than the last two games, the new tracks are appreciated and sound very good. Overall, I think that Super Mario Bros. 2 is not only worthy of being called a Mario game, it is worthy of being called the true sequel to Super Mario Bros. While many of this game's ideas aren't really implemented in future 2D Mario games, it does set the basis for the 3D Mario games, such as having a health bar and using the environment of a level to benefit the player. 
While it could have been changed a little more from Doki Doki Panic, the game is still a blast to play. Initially, when I first played it, I didn't think much of it, but over the last few years, it has become one of my favorite NES games and ranks as my 10th favorite Mario game of all time. If you've never played this game because you thought it wasn't a true Mario game or for whatever reason, try it out sometime. You may find it to be more interesting and enjoyable than other Mario games. The game has been re-released many times, but in my opinion, the best version is the remake titled Super Mario Advance for the Game Boy Advance. This version is essentially the Super Nintendo version of the game, but it added sound bits for each character and improved the amount of parts that appear on screen. However, this version is only available on the Game Boy Advance and Wii U, unless you use an emulator. If you want the closest experience to the original with the best looks, then play the All-Stars version, which is now available on the Super Nintendo Online app. The original is also available on the Switch with the NES Online app. If you had a really hard time with the lost levels, then this game should be much more relaxing and enjoyable to play. But, that's all I have to say about this game. Now as we speak, we're nearing the end of the 8-bit area for Mario. But don't put away your NES controllers just yet, because we have one more game to look at for the NES, and that is Super Mario Bros. 3. Well, I gotta get to work on this one, so I'll see you in about a week, and I'll see you for the next review.